Okay, so let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast of the nerd, the free flow braincast of the nerd. I am your currently emotionally constipated, but slightly less so because I'm actually working host, Ian. That may have been a little bit too much information, but if we're not here to talk about my figuring out more better productivity and emotional laxatives, what the hell are we here to figure out? But enough about me. Hi. How are you? I've missed you. Uh, I want you to know, as much as I have a love-hate relationship with sitting down to record the podcast and all of the stage fright and the what the hell am I going to talk about this week that I deal with and confront in my head, it has nothing to do with you and how I feel about you. If me and the podcast ever split up, I want you to know that we both still love you. Sorry. I'm in a mood today, definitely a little tense, but I will try not to get any of that on you. <sighs> today, I thought I might talk with you about sobriety and productivity update. My sobriotivity? Eh, eh, such as it is. Uh, a bit about... Wild Strawberries, which is the movie that um, Jack and I watched for um, our list of shame between now and the last podcast. And then two stories about performing, followed by uh, chapter 18 of Here Is Gone by Terry Boda, our weekly uh, fanfic reading. So productivity update. Um, things are good. Still sober. Been working out pretty steadily. Actually, last week was some of the most productive exercise... Exercise. Some of the most productive exercise that I've had since we started this whole shebang uh, back around New Year's. Been working on the novel with Lonnie on the weekends, and despite the evidence that you may be lacking for visually, have been making steady progress on the Shindig script. In fact... It's done, which is why uh, we're talking today. Online dating has been moving a little a little bit, chatting with some very nice people, uh, sent some messages here and there. That's been the odd thing. Um, so much of my mood is tied to the channel, the latest video, and it's the same cycle with every video. I finish the video, and there's this halo effect for about a week. All of the self-doubt and frustrations and anxiety that has been building up are gone. I feel a strong sense of, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually good at this thing. I know how to do it. I know the instrument. And I'm learning to feel some pride and satisfaction in my work. Thank you, Lonnie. Then the second week happens. And whatever minuscule amount of work I've managed to putz out in the first week is now starting to look like not enough. Time to knuckle down, I think. Let's get this done. Let's crank. But do I really have anything interesting to say about this video? What if I what what if I don't? What if I'm what if I'm not what if this video's boring? Then the third week comes along. Now I'm late. Now I'm feeling the behinds. I've got the behinds in my face. That's when the weight sets in. The shoulders feel heavy. I start to feel bad letting myself do other things. I should be working. Why aren't I working? I should be working. Then week four. Now, and pardon the phrase, I'm a piece of shit. I'm not, by the way. I know, I'm just giving voice to the internal monologue. Now I'm I'm like, I'm failing at this full-time gig. What the hell is wrong with me? Why can't I get this? I should go back to cubicle life, give up on the full-time gig. And I run through all the evidence to support that perspective. And then, usually within the span of a couple of days, I get finish the script. I realize I've got something that, I want to say, or that's, I feel like, um, you guys will enjoy. And then I record it, edit it, and publish it within the span of a couple of days. 
It's the same cycle every time. We are talking, because I finished the script, which is like the eye of this particular storm. Um, after this, I record, edit, until I can't see straight, and the cycle starts over. But so here's the thing. Here's the thing. This full-time gig, I've realized, is really about this loop. It's not about my writing ability. It's not about whether or not I know how to edit any of that. In fact, I know conclusively that all of my aptitude for those things has improved dramatically since I quit my job. My writing's just better. So the full-time gig is not about that. Improving those things is just the natural result of repetition plus a deeply critical eye for my own stuff. No, my friends. The full-time gig is about the loop. I've been coming at this from a skewed perspective, I think. Schedule and to-do lists and GTD systems and your basic first time starting a business nonsense. And all of those things might have been a good place to start for someone else. But I am me, and my main professional challenge in life is the loop and all that that entails. If I conquer the loop, then a video every two weeks starts to happen. Schedules start to get hit. Patreon subscribers grow. I then have health insurance that I'm not terrified to actually use. If I don't, I go back to working for someone else where there is no loop. Just the constant daily encroaching nihilism of working 10 hours a day at something I don't care about with a bunch of other people who are also stuck in, we'll say, Nietzsche's prison with me. That was hyperbolic and dramatic. At least Nietzsche's employees have better health insurance than I do. My point, what is my point? My point is that this week I started thinking about another loop I've been trying to get myself out of. 20 years of hard drinking. And oddly, I think that there are parallels I've had a few thoughts about my sobriety I thought I'd share with you. Um, my sobriety loop used to be things got bad. I wondered if I was an alcoholic. Ha. Huh? I decided uh, I quit. I quit for extended periods. I said, oh, see, I'm fine. I don't have a problem. I'm not compelled to drink. Uh, I'm not, actually. I was misunderstanding my particular brand of souse. Uh, but then... I'd say, well, I can have one. Three months later, I'm back where I started. And that bears a certain resemblance to the productivity loop, don't you think? That shine of a new video, the reflected glow, and me thinking, oh, I'm fine. I don't have to turn on all of the apps and website blockers. I don't have to use the Pomodoro timer. I don't have to ask Lonnie if I can cubicle buddy with her for a day to get the script done. I'm good at this. I'm good. I'm good. Now, I'm sorry if this is confusing and masturbatory, but that's probably the subtitle of this podcast. I'm thinking through this right now, uh, applying the same model for alcohol. With alcohol, I was misunderstanding the actual problem. The problem wasn't I was compulsed to have a drink, that when I woke up, I needed a drink or couldn't go a few days without drinking. The problem was if I allowed myself to have one, one turns to 20 on a long enough timeline. All that time... I had been trying to attack the wrong problem. The cost of trying to train myself to drink like normies out there uh, was costing me relationships, dignity, and self-love. That was a bit of a rabbit hole. I just haven't really expressed some of these ideas to myself clearly, I guess. But with videos in the channel, maybe we can apply the same model. The problem isn't really whether or not I know how to do the next video. The problem is I can't let up on the structure that allows me to get those things done. If my productivity is a machine, and it's built from website blockers and habits and Pomodoro timers and Google Docs and all of that, just because the last video got done a day or two ago doesn't mean that I don't need that machine today. I'll get the next video done. I know how to do it. That is not the problem. The problem is I don't get a break from the habit and routine of it all, just because I've uh, put the voices of self-doubt in 
my head to rest, to sleep for a few days. Um, you know, this whole systems of rewards and, oh, now I, now I, now I can, now I don't need to do this or no, just now, now I'm just going to give my, you know, now I'll just, I, I went three months without drinking. Now I'll have a drink. Uh, it doesn't work with my kind of personality, you know. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a Toby. <laughs> I just, I can't just execute. My particular brand of work from home requires that I make concessions for its shortcomings. Accept it for what it is. No shame. No self hatred. Well, not a lot of shame, and and as little self hatred as I can manage go from there. But um, I'm not advocating for relentlessness. We all have batteries, and I know I need to accept that I mine need to get filled. So I decided two things this week. First, uh, the system I was trying to go with was I would take two days off after I published every video. That didn't... That that didn't end up working for two reasons. First, the day after I published, I would sit and scan comments and reply, and that's not taking a day off. Uh, and the second problem is that once I get deeply mired in the loop, uh, I end up not allowing myself to not think about the channel and do anything else. I just make myself miserable, uh, get all distracted and stuck and grumpy. So I'm going back to taking weekends off. Patreon Hangouts accepted every weekend. Don't touch the channel. I can work on habits, other things, maybe this podcast, but weekends are for self-care. Errands, games, and laundry. Laundry. I'm in the basement now. The laundry machines are upstairs. Laundry. Speaking of games, I think I'm going to stop uh, game streaming. Now the Boris is among you. I can hear you, Boris may say, uh, but you really haven't been game streaming. And that's true. I haven't. But I've been thinking about game streaming. This is what I'm saying. Like, I can't shut the channel off. The I can't. It's just always on in my head. Some version of what the next thing is. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's everything I do, really. And I, I need it to not be sometimes. Um... So thinking about I should be game streaming, not playing games that I want to because I think I should stream this. Last week, I finally did a game stream for a game I've been anticipating for a long time, Half-Life Alex. And I noticed I didn't get into it. I didn't have as much fun. I got self-conscious. I didn't really get into the game the way I wanted to. And then when I was recovering this weekend from getting sick... I ended up dipping into my Steam library and playing several things I hadn't touched in a long time for hours. The you know being sick is is a blank check to do whatever the hell you want to do. Um, and I got hooked. I got hooked into some games. I was playing uh, Arkham Origins, which I never finished, and really the Red Hood section in that really hooked me. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I hadn't felt that feeling in a while because I, uh, the game streaming does not allow me to get absorbed into the thing that I'm doing the same way. You know, it's one part hanging out with you guys and it's one part, uh, the game. Now I'm not saying I'm never going to game stream again, but I'm going to stop thinking of it as something I need to start doing with regularity or on a schedule. The channel is enough for that. Um, or that I can't touch a game without streaming it. I'll tweet when I do, but uh, I'm going to make it mostly just a for me thing. And that feels lovely. Uh, I've got to stop trying to turn everything into content, which is a, um, a hazard of this position. I knew in advance, but now I can see evidence of it. Um, oh, I mentioned I have, uh, I had a couple of sobriety thoughts. I don't know why I would share these, but that's what we're here for, right? <laughs> you know, uh, productivity and emotional laxatives and oversharing. <laughs> that is also the subtitle of this podcast. I need to be more clear in my language. Um, I keep saying that I, I can 
not drink. But the truth of that is, is uh, I probably mean that more in the Mark Twain sense of quitting smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. Staying quit for any length of time beyond the three-month marker is going to be a new thing. And I've been saying that something feels different this time. Something feels changed, that I feel like I'm just done. And I couldn't really put it into words, but it felt like You know, it felt like um, there was a switch and it was off. And whatever the reasons, um, I, I, what I'm trying to say is I was a little um, sure of myself. <laughs> um this weekend, two things happened. The first was I was reading this woman's dating profile, and she mentioned wine, wine, and more wine. Did I say I like wine? And I felt something that I didn't quite put into words, but I'll explain in a minute. And the other thing that happened this weekend was I started considering whatever life is going to look like whenever I move out of this house of, I forget if it's nine or ten people, away from these six kids, away from the baby that I get along with so well, out of Nigel's house, and uh, thinking about it, I felt in my stomach, I, I knew, and not rationally, not like I considered the thought and the pros and cons and weighed the strengths and capabilities, I just had this surety that if I moved out, my sobriety would fail. Um, so what's different about this attempt, at least for right now, is that I'm here that I don't want to be a bad influence on one of my best friend's kids. I actually like these kids. The baby is the first time I've ever met a baby I get along with. They're usually just so needy. Now I get butthurt when she's not when she's napping and 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 doesn't pay attention to me. Um, I don't want to risk my opportunity to be a positive influence, and I care what they think of me. So much so that I just feel this certainty that while I'm here, the switch in my head is in the off position. But if I went back to living alone, I don't know. Um, there wouldn't be the same bar that I was trying to live up to, keeping my word to a friend, honoring the relationship with his family. Like it or not, uh, there probably isn't a person in my life that I treat worse than myself or with whom I have a weaker commitment to keeping my word. Now, that's not, I don't mean that as some low self esteem sort of pablum. Think about it. Think about your best friend. If you made a promise to your best friend, think about the likelihood of you keeping that promise. Now, you make a promise to yourself that you're going to start your novel tomorrow or eat better or exercise or whatever your albatross goal has been, how likely are you to do that than keep um, your promise to the friend? Now, I know after years of making this same mistake with the channel um, that I had some objective sense of how anything works. I know there are some of you that answered that question uh, and would keep those promises equally. And God, more power to you. Um, but I know a lot of you have the same struggle. It's tough to love yourself with the same kind of commitment that you do to others. After all, you know where all your bodies are buried. Um, now, looking at that, that, looking at that woman's profile, I again impulsively just felt I would drink. I wouldn't want to tell her I was sober. I wouldn't want to seem unfun and incapable. I don't know why. I can't dunk a basketball, and I can't have more. Uh, I can't have one drink without it turning into more uh, than one drink. And reading her profile, I thought uh, three months later I'd be back in the loop. You may ask. We, you and I are so open. <laughs> well, it, it's kind of a weird thing, and I don't know how I got here. Um, and and it's not anything um, 
it's not dishonest, but I, uh, if, if, if I have a brand, if Passion of the Nerd is a brand, then it seems as though I've predicated the entire thing on vulnerability and growth. Is that weird? <laughs> um, you know, the brand... <laughs> The brand is not the brand if I don't uh, if I'm not telling the truth. That's weird, isn't it? Whatever. Uh, the other thing that finally occurred to me, which might seem obvious, but it's something I'm now realizing I'm always going to have to contend with, is I want all the wine and all the whiskey, but that's mostly when I've run out of wine. I want to numb up. I want to silence the voices for an evening. How could you not want peace? I want the five bottles. I'm choosing not to anymore. I've said I'm not going to, but that want is always going to be there. My choice doesn't cure me of it. There is no cure. Donuts always taste delicious. Heroin always wants you back. And I'm always going to want to self-medicate. Because I know how effective it is for an evening. So that's fun. <laughs> anyway. Um, so this... Uh, it's been about a week. But uh, I, I wanted to share with you... Um, Play. Did I put you in? Yeah, okay. Uh, Jack and I watched Wild Strawberries between now and the last podcast. And I think I tweeted about it, but I don't think I've talked about it. It was my favorite thing that we've watched so far. I've told you my two favorite performances from everything we've watched are two favorite characters, but those two uh, ideas are very related. Frankenfurter uh, from Rocky Horror and Atticus Finch. Um, from To Kill a Mockingbird. But Wild Strawberries might be my favorite movie out of the 11 or 12 that we've gone through. Um, it was Jack said he, if he had been of the proper age, had he seen the movie in 1957, then it would have been one of his favorite films of all time, which I think is an interesting way of phrasing it. You know, It'll be interesting to, to, to see if anything... Uh, if, uh, neither of us are... are big classic film watchers, which is part of the reason we are doing this. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if anything that we watch sort of uh, breaks through into our personal um, greatest stuff. But anyway, I, I, I think I mentioned the comparison. If Spartacus were Gladiator and Braveheart and Lawrence of Arabia was the English patient, then Wild Strawberries would be uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It's very personal. It's very intimate. It's very emotional. Um, it, and it's very um, creative and surreal in the in the similar fit way that um, it's about something intimate and specific, as opposed to these sort of broad epics that that we've been watching. The movie was directed by Ingmar Bergman. My um, First movie of his I've ever seen. It's a Swedish film subtitled about a man who is regarded by his friends and family as being kind of mean and distant. He's old and retired now, and he's going to be honored with this award in a different city, and he decides to drive to take a road trip to that city instead of fly. On the way, he stops at various sites that related to his life and experiences from his um, life growing up. And he experiences those memories as though they were happening again, uh, a Christmas Carol style. There's a lot of surrealist imagery. Uh, the middle of the movie has a 15-minute dream sequence, but it's fascinating and really kind of works. And it opens with him having a premonition about his own death. So I thought I had a good idea where the movie was going, but it didn't end up that way. He has a memory of his first teenage crush and kissing her and later has this memory of his wife um, and comes to his wife that has passed away and comes to understand why their relationship 
didn't work out and why he's distant with his son now. And I felt like the movie was clearly steering us towards this tragic ending, but it doesn't go there. He reconciles. He makes peace. Uh, and it was really kind of moving and beautiful. There were parts where both Jack and I clutched at our chest and went, oh, this is so, that's really, it's so pretty. I really enjoyed it. Um, and there was a phenomena represented in the film that I've not seen anywhere else, and I really appreciate it. So he has this memory of himself as a teenager romancing his first crush and kissing her. And on the road trip as an old man, he picks up this teenage woman and her two boyfriends. And he's in his 70s. And she has, uh, she and the two guys are maybe 20. But she's clearly a dead ringer for his first crush. And we see in the memory, as the memory um, is reenacted, the feelings he still has um, from that moment in time. They haven't aged. Those The memory is timeless. But in the car, in these moments as an old man with this young woman, we see what an absurdity that is. The gulf of maturity that um, is between he as an old man and the young hitchhiker with her two boyfriends. But our memories don't age with us and our feelings don't. Our shames, our embarrassments, our desires. It's part of the reason it's so damn hard to forgive ourselves because when we make a mistake, it's like we make that mistake for the rest of our lives. We can't see the change and the growth and the atonement. But it but the absurdity of that issue was visually represented on screen in the movie. And it was really affecting um, in a way that I didn't expect. I mean, I, I had no expectations, which was, was great. But um, it was so subtle, the use of that young character and the contrast between the two. Ingmar Bergman's most famous film is probably The Seventh Seal. I had zero expectations going to this, but after now, I'm really excited to watch um, the, I think four of his movies are on um, our list, Fanny and Alexander and uh, Seventh Seal, Wild Strawberries and something I'm forgetting. Um, this will probably be the first film from our list of shame project that I go back and watch. I mean, I'm going to see Rocky Horror but at some point, but uh, that's not a quarantine experience. Um, watching Wild Strawberries again is probably definitely something that I'm going to be doing. Uh, uh, today we're watching The Red Shoes. No idea. I know it has ballet, and I know it has shoes, and they're red. That's all I know about it. I'll tell you more about it on Monday... Probably, you know how it goes. For some reason, um, I was thinking about two memories recently. I mean, kind of apropos of nothing. I've described myself as an outgoing introvert, which feels contradictory, but I think other people that are that combination get it. Um, shy introvert is probably a more common thing. But anyway, I'm not sure... While I think that 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 shy and outgoing can fluctuate, it seems like introversion and extroversion are maybe more static in in our personalities. Maybe that's not true. But I look at Nigel's um, two boys. They're about a year apart, and they could not be more different. One of them is this sensitive, calm, thoughtful kid. And the other is a bulldozer, stubborn as hell, who literally runs into walls sometimes. They're vastly different in the way they relate to anything. And the thing I find mind-boggling is that between them, they have a total of five, six years of being alive total. They don't have enough accumulated personal baggage to really account for all the ways in which they're as different as they are, which makes me kind of wonder about... Um, you know, how much does the genetic lottery play into things like attitude and personality type? It's got to be uh, more than we think is is all I'm thinking about. You know, which yeah, as a 40-year-old man, I'm not sure if that 
should have any bearing one way or another on uh, conduct or um, any of that. It's just interesting. But anyway, um, I was thinking about the way I overcame my shyness. And it was through theater and performance, getting to be someone else, getting to pretend uh, to be someone else. And the thing is, performance is a bit like the episode guides. Yes, you're playing someone else, uh, but when you're doing it well, you're generating the emotions of that character. You're not just externally pantomiming them. I should never speak in absolutes. I'm sure some actors externally pantomime. But I think a lot of actors want to generate their own sadness or joy or rage in place. And that's the way I was. So two memories that um, stand out for me. The first was, I think, my very first experience ever performing. I was six or seven years old. Um, I may have told this story on an edit live stream before, but one of the big things we used to do as a family in the summertime was drive to Lake Powell. Uh, my sisters and my, my parents and my two older sisters, we'd rent a houseboat and take it out on Lake Powell for a week, motoring around and seeing the sights. I absolutely loved it. My favorite memories of my family were during this time in an unusually cooped up space when we were all stuck together. And I'm sure part of my weird attraction to boats and tiny living spaces um, relates to these memories. <coughs> but anyway, in a, um, in a multi-hour car ride with a six-year-old and two teenage girls, none of whom particularly get along with each other, eh, that can be something of a nightmare. So my parents bought us all Walkman, and we were allowed to pick out stuff to listen to, cassettes. I don't remember what I picked out, but I remember farming my parents' collection and finding a this stand-up comedy tape. And I would listen to it and listen to it and listen to it. During the week, we'd take our sleeping bags up to the roof of the houseboat in the evenings. And we'd all lie out under the stars. And I've always been a parrot. Um, annoying though it can be. Um, without realizing it... I was listening to the tape and I would start reciting bits of it, performing it with the inflection, the rhythm. I copied the performance and it's part of the way I learned to tell a story or a joke. And the family, without me realizing it, started listening. Such by the end of the trip, I would memorize one of the routines from the tape and then perform them for the family each evening before we go to bed. Everyone would have a good laugh. We'd go to sleep. And do it again the next day. And that's the first time I really learned the power of the of performance, sharing an emotional experience. And of course, the attention was for a six-year-old was incredible. The tape was Bill Cosby himself. And um, for some reason, I still have some of it memorized. Dentists tell you not to pick your teeth with any sharp metal object. Then you sit in their chair, and the first thing they grab is an iron hook. Now the dentist, anyway, talk about art versus the artist. The memory uh, is one of my personal treasures and interpreted through today's lens. It's the story of a six-year-old memorizing and performing for his family the comedy routines of a serial rapist. But that's not really what the story is about. Um, the other memory uh, that I thought I'd share with you uh, happened a few years later. I'm 10 years old. I'm at summer camp called Colorado Mountain Ranch, and I'm deeply depressed. Uh, don't really know it, because it's the first time I've ever really had to deal with depression. My parents have been separating and dealing with their divorce, and this summer, while I'm here at Colorado Mountain Ranch, my dad is packing all of our stuff to move he and I to Illinois, <clears throat> where we're going to live with his high school sweet sweetheart and her two older teenage daughters. Funny thinking about those memories now <clears throat> that I'm the age my dad was. But that at, but at that age, um, it was as though my parents were completely changing the shape of the world, um, remixing everything and, and recombining. Um, 
the world that I knew and I loved and was comfortable with. Being a parent and a human being with all that comes with that has to be, I, I can't even imagine the challenge uh, now that I'm at the age where, you know, I would be faced with a similar decision if I had gone the same path. Anyway, so I'm at Colorado Mountain Ranch. I'm just quiet, numb. I'm not eating. I remember uh, they were super worried because my appetite died, and I couldn't figure out why. I just wasn't hungry. But I started writing these things. Up to that point, I'd written stories about a Detective Fox who was more than a little derivative of Sherlock Holmes, except he was a fox, and his rabbit partner, Hobson was smarter than he was. But this summer, I'm still proud of Hobson. How am I still proud of Hobson? What? <laughs> but this summer, um, I started writing meaty, teenage, angsty things a little early. We would be riding around on horseback and shooting guns and rock climbing, and I would be thinking about my angst and pain and sadness. It was the first time I realized that my emotions could be in the writing. That writing wasn't some magic trick of these events that you staged and arranged in a certain way and then emotions magically ensued. Emotion is the music that plays along with the events side by side. And I remember there was a camp counselor who was also a writer. I wish I could remember his name. I think it was Dean... But he was always writing in his notebook, too, and so I bonded with him. And I was writing these things, and I started getting some validation from the camp counselors for my writing. I was at camp for more than a month, and at some point it was announced they were going to put on a talent show. Any of the campers could sign up, and if you didn't sign up, you had to watch the talent show. Watching a talent show sounded like not a lot of fun. So on a whim, I signed up. And the day comes, I start to get this what the hell did I do that for thing. Doing stand-up for your family is one thing, but I was going to read my sad writing in front of hundreds of campers? I was barely out of the youngest camper's cabin, too. This was a terrible idea. I start getting more nervous. I inquire about maybe backing out and come to find out that some industrious counselor printed up a program from the sign-up sheet, which means now if I decide not to read what I wrote, the rest of the campers will know I chickened out. What the hell were they thinking? The thing starts, and there are kids doing magic tricks, good ones, Another kid could juggle. You know, feats of ability and physical performance. And come to the performance right before mine. And there were these two sisters, and they were fly girl dancing. Fly girl dancing. Do you know how cool that is? I'm going to go out there with my angsty... Nonsense after fly girl dancing? So I'm in full-on panic mode at this point. I might have started crying. A handful of counselors come out, and they're like, are, 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 are you okay? Including Brooke, who I had a crush on so much so that I stole a picture of her out of another counselor. A anyway, I'm in front of my crush and some of the counselors crying and telling them that I can't go on after fly girl dancers. And Dean, who now in my aged, flawed memory looks pretty much exactly like David Foster Wallace with the bandana and glad Dean Foster Wallace walks up to me and says, Ian, how about if I go on with you? I'll read something I wrote and you read something you wrote. And I sniffle away my tears with the napkin Brooke brought me and I say, oh, okay. So Brooke calls next up. Ian and, De Ian and Dean. And we go out there. I stand behind Dean. We're in the cafeteria hall. The whole room 
is filled with campers, cross-legged in front, all the way to the back. They've organized themselves youngest to oldest because that's just what kids do. I don't know. Maybe 250, 300 campers. And Dean reads this poem he wrote about a rose. And it was this beautiful thing. I remember he found some way in which the color of the rose was a symbol for something. I don't I don't remember. I just remember I thought it was way better than what I wrote. But him reading this poem, this beautiful poem about something simple after fly girl dancers gave me the courage to step up after him and read. It was a river. Pure, clean, and clear. It would be my refuge. I threw down my coat, leapt into the water, and drank, slowly closing my eyes. It was all so vivid. I remember mother sobbing on the ravaged landscape. And then like so many others before her, she let her body fall to the ground and her life flutter away. But I had sworn I would find something pure, something clean, something that hadn't been affected by the endless bombing raids. And here it was, the river. This would be my refuge, my resting place. I opened my eyes to watch my body float, lungs full of water, lifelessly down the river. <laughs> I do that to a room full of campers who had just been watching awesome fly girl dancing. I, I'm going to be honest. I have zero memory of what happened afterwards. I would imagine uh, a confused silence and then a bizarre slow clap. Um, I don't think anyone had any idea exactly how to react to something like that, especially six- and seven-year-old campers who were there for the day. Probably Dean started courtesy applauding, and maybe there was a bunch of like, oh, we, we clap. This is we, we clap now. <laughs> and I walked off stage. But the point is, I could have walked off to silence, and it still would have been an accomplishment that I remember to this day. You know, whether you're Tommy Wiseau or Christopher Nolan, part of making anything is the sharing of it. And getting up on stage in front of people and reading was a mountain in and of its own. I made a thing. I put it out there. I was afraid and I did it. And I think that experience is just kind of everything to life. I experience some version of that whenever I start recording this podcast. But I've lived a good portion of my life letting fear dictate my decisions and thinking it was good sense without knowing what I was doing, really. And I don't ever want to do that again. Fear is a barometer for potential consequences, but it can't tell you what's right. Anyway, <laughs> let's get to the reading. Um, and of course, I uh, didn't prep those notes uh, appropriately. So give me just a moment. Uh... Before we do, uh, just a reminder that this Saturday at 4.15 p.m. Mountain Time, I'm going to try and start earlier because the episode guide is ginormous. Um, I'm going to be firing up the stream for the Patreon Hangout, an episode discussion thing type dealy that we do. Uh, this week, I know we're at least discussing 5x5. Five five. Given the way the Patreon vote has been going, Sanctuary will be a week from Saturday. I just want to let you know that I'm uh, at Ian Nitram on Twitter and YouTube.com slash Passion of the Nerd. 
If you'd like to support the channel, keep me flush with Easy Mac and, you know, with hot dogs heated up and chopped up and put inside of them and mixed into it, you can do so at patreon.com slash passion of the nerd with the $5 and up club. You can join me in the hangout this weekend, or you can support me by grabbing yourself something from passion of the nerd.com slash store. There's reading lists, suggested, um, type stuff, things I write for a living. <laughs> Um, and, uh, even though, uh, they're not going to be a regular thing, if you're an Amazon prime member, you may not realize this, but you can support me for free by using your monthly Amazon prime Twitch subscription at twitch.tv slash the passion of the nerd that works whether or not I'm streaming. Um, and if it's not something you're going to, uh, use for, you know, actual streamers who are doing the actual streaming, I appreciate it. So, um, today's reading. Here is Gone, Chapter 18, by Terry Boda. Links in the show notes to the previous chapter readings if you need to get caught up. And we're almost to the point where I'm going to do another 10-chapter um, compilation. Uh, there's some thumpy-thumpies going on above my head. For that, I apologize. Spike slept for the better part of the next two days, only regaining consciousness to drink blood that had been prepared for him. The Wicca's spell lasted almost 24 hours before wearing off. By that time, vampire healing had kicked in and most of his bones had set. His other wounds, however, the ones none of them could see, they still ached, and his soul was still in shock. It would be weeks before it came out of its shell. In the meantime, his demon, much better at handling pain, was seething and angry at the treatment that had been visited upon it. Giles came and went, as did most of the Scoobies, but Buffy was strangely absent from the visitor's list. He wasn't sure how she, he should feel about that, and in truth, he was very conflicted. Giles had alluded to Buffy's deep remorse for beating him to a pulp, but no one had come out and actually said she was sorry. He felt that if Buffy's guilt was truly genuine, then the Slayer would have made some attempt to make amends. But so far he hadn't seen hide nor hair of her, not even a message sent through another member of the group. He knew Joyce had gone back to the hospital for her surgery and was crushed that he had missed it. Dawn and Joyce had actually treated him like a man, and even if he had decided to give up on Buffy, he had no intention of giving up on the rest of the girls, or abandoning his plan. He took comfort, however, in knowing that the woman came through the, in knowing that the woman came through the surgery fine, and was expected to make a full recovery. Knowing in advance that Joyce would die of a blood clot gave him some options. After thinking about it, he decided that the best course of action was to convince Joyce to go on blood thinners as soon as possible. Of all the Scoobies, Tara was the most solicitous, but her attentions made him uncomfortable because she always looked at him with these knowing eyes. She would cast him questioning glances and make leading comments, and he was hard-pressed to relax around her because he was afraid of slipping up. The girl was just too observant and too smart. One wrong comment on his part, and he would give everything away. As it was, he was certain that she was on to him. Giles seemed perplexed by him as well. And Spike wondered if he wasn't being enough of a pain in the ass. The Watcher kept giving him odd looks, perhaps comparing this visit against the last time he had been a guest in the Watcher's house. The notion irritated Spike, not only because his soul berated him for wanting to be a poor house guest, but also because he felt that he deserved to be quiet and withdrawn after this ordeal. Next thing you know, he'll be busting my chops for not being evil enough. The Watcher was particularly disturbed by Spike's nightmares, and he was terrified that he'd said something revealing during one of his dreams. Giles hadn't said anything and he'd explained it off as post-traumatic stress from being beaten to within a pulp, beaten to within an inch of his own life. 
But he could see the doubts in the human's eyes, questions that swam just beneath the surface, and he knew he had to get out of there. Besides, the wheel was still turning, and there were things he had to do if he wanted to protect Dawn and Buffy. He decided to leave as soon as he could fight again. On the third day, he fell asleep on the couch and woke up sitting upright. An experimental tug of his arms revealed that he was chained to one of Giles' dining room chairs. Oh, goody, bloody deja vu. He opened his eyes and raised his head to see Giles sitting on the couch facing him. The watcher was just watching him quietly, his face pensive and sad. Oi, Rupert, what's this all about then? he asked, trying to stay calm. Giles sighed, swallowed, and took a deep breath. While I don't support or condone what Buffy did to you, I do share her sentiment that you are not being entirely forthcoming with us. It's been three days since the incident in the training room, and I felt that you were sufficiently along in your healing to answer some questions. Spike swallowed and set his jaw inwardly, trying to calm the butterflies in his stomach. Giles removed his glasses and cleaned them. I don't suppose that you feel up to answering truthfully of your own free will. He didn't answer, but raised his chin, straightened his shoulders defiantly. Giles sighed and looked away to a book and bag on the sofa next to him. I thought not. Giles reached for the book and bag, and Spike knew with frightening clarity what the man intended to do. I'm afraid you've left me no choice but to cast a truth spell on you and force you to answer. These are dangerous times we're in, and we don't and we need to know what you know. I'm not working against you, Rupert. L leave it at that, he tried, a note of warning and desperation creeping into his vo voice. Giles opened the book to a pre-marked page and removed the spell components from the bag. I'm afraid I can't expect that from you, Spike. Your history and very nature lend you to dishonesty. His mouth went dry and he tugged at the chains. Believe me, Watcher, you don't want to do this. I'm quite sure I don't. However, you left me no choice. He closed his eyes and gritted his teeth as Giles cast the spell. He felt the magic move into him, tingling through his borrowed blood, and he fought back tears. He heard Giles set up a tape recorder and set it running. Let us begin with your name. Who are you? Giles asked. Spike tried to fight the compulsion, but his mouth opened and words came out. Spike. William the Bloody, Scourge of Europe, Slayer of Slayers. Why are you here? He bit his tongue, but it made no difference. To fix it, his mouth betrayed. There was a pause, then Giles asked tentatively, to fix what? What happened? You mean what happened with glory? Yes. His hands clenched and unclenched. He felt the shackles digging into his wrists, his mouth was full of blood from biting the inside of his cheek, but it was losing a battle. The spell was too strong. He was too weak. You know what she's planning? Yes, he replied, beginning to rock with sweat and strain. You have an informant in the demon underground? No. Are you working with glory? No, he roared, his demon coming forth. Never. I would never help that hell bitch. And yet you have had knowledge of her plans. How do you know this? He shook off the demon and set his jaw, fighting the compulsion. He started to shake. No, no, I will not answer. Drew said daisies always lie. They die, they die, they die. Run and catch, run and catch. The lamb is caught in the blackberry patch. How do you know this? Giles demanded forcefully. Spike bared his teeth and howled, trying to rip his arms free of the change. How do you know this? William the Bloody, answer the question. Giles ordered, pulling on the magical line of compulsion. Because I saw it! The reply tore out of him, shredding his efforts to contain himself. You have knowledge of future events? Yes! How? He snarled and growled, writhing on the chair. But he was unable to break the shackles, and he realized that the truth spell was also a spell of binding. You bound me, you bastard! Giles was relentless. It will wear off in a few hours. Answer the question, how do you know of future events? Because I was there. I lived it. The answer broke him, and he slumped back in the chair, his head bowed. Tears streamed down his cheeks. He, you lived it? How? 
He gave the man a, th a hateful glare, breathing hard. How do you think? Giles looked at him, stunned. Then the realization came over his face. You've come back in time. Yes. How far? Two years. How? Demon in Africa. Why? Because I wished it. Why? Because I have to make amends. Why? Did you betray Dawn to Glory? No. Why do you need to make amends? He was crying freely now, the tears running down his cheeks as he fought the pain in the memory. Because I hurt her. Who? Buffy. And I wish to make it better. To do it again. To do it different so none of it ever happened. I didn't say when or how far. The demon s sent me back here. I, th I thought it was so I could make all of it better. Stop glory before. Giles stopped and both men stared at each other, breathing hard. Then Giles spoke softly. Something truly horrible is going to happen, isn't it? Spike nodded. Yes. Buffy dies trying to save Dawn. He gave a hysterical laugh that broke into a sob. Oh, Rupert, that's only the beginning. <laughs> ah, I'm so into it. I'm excited. I have seen your comments, by the way, on the podcast channel. I know some of you have read ahead. And I've heard, um, I believe uh, Terry wrote this at the end of Buffy Season 6, before Season 7 had aired. So, um, you know, um, keep that in mind. But uh, it's compelling. I'm really having a lot of fun. All right, friends. That's it. I will try and be back with you this Monday, if only for a double chapter reading and a hello. You know, what is there to say? I hope you're holding up. Have a good weekend, and please be kind to yourself.